I'm Derek Rangel, and thank you for being a participant on this webinar. Today we're going to address uh, what is an advanced healthcare directive. And for this discussion, uh, I've asked Attorney Paul Velasco, who is a, a estate planning and trust attorney in Long Beach area, to uh, join us in on this conversation. He is actually who provoked uh, this by a posting on social media about this topic, and I thought it was intriguing. Uh, based on where we are with COVID-19, that it was appropriate to have this discussion at length um, for our viewers who don't know what it is. So uh, welcome, Paul Velasco, and uh, let's get to our, our interview here. Um, Thank you. Uh, so first of all, what is an advanced healthcare directive? Well, an advanced healthcare directive is, it's a legal document. It's a legal document that allows a person to designate the person that they choose, the person of their choice, to make healthcare decisions for them in the event that that person is unable to make healthcare decisions for, their, for themselves at some point. So if somebody becomes incapacitated and incapable of making decisions for themselves, they can designate the person that they choose or persons that they choose to make those decisions for them. And the advanced healthcare directive, directive allows them to make certain, certain decisions such as uh, end of life, whether or not you wanna be kept on life support, Mm -hmm. It allows a person to express whether or not they want to be cremated or they're an organ donor. Um, it also includes things like determining where a person will live, who will have the power to do that, uh, hiring caregivers, you know, arranging even for recreation and entertainment. So it allows the person under the health care directive to take care of your health care decisions. Okay, so um, you touched on one of the uh, aspects of it becoming, or when does it become effective? Yes. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more about uh, what, when does a, an advanced healthcare directive become effective? Yes, of course. So a, a directive becomes effective in one of two situations. Either number one, you make the healthcare directive effective immediately when you sign it. And often people who are already elderly and need assistance or need somebody to be helping them with their medical decisions will make the directive effective immediately upon signing it. So upon signing it, they're immediately giving power to other people to make health care or to participate in the health care decision making process. So that means that somebody signs it, it's effective immediately, and the document will state that. Uh, in many situations though, in situations where a, certain, a person is young and, and relatively healthy and they don't need somebody to make decisions for them immediately, then the healthcare directive will spring into effect only when that person becomes incapacitated. Mm. And incapacity is typically defined by a letter from a doctor stating that in the doctor's opinion, after having examined the person, that in the doctor's opinion, they're not capable of making their own healthcare decisions anymore. Okay. In that situation, the healthcare directive will become effective and allow the persons designated to make healthcare decisions for the person who signed it. Okay. Um, is an advanced healthcare directive the same as a DNR order? Uh, that's a do not resuscitate, or are they different? Have so, how so? So, no, those are two different things, and they're often confused. People often confuse an advanced healthcare directive for a DNR order. Uh, a DNR order is really is a, is a medical order. It's written by a doctor, it's signed by a doctor along with the patient. Uh, it instructs healthcare. Uh, in healthcare providers not to do cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR mm -hmm. if a patient stops breathing or their heart stops beating. So that is very specific. And often it's used in situations where people who sign those DNRs are elderly uh, or they have a terminal illness and they do not want to be resuscitated in any event. Uh, but most people will not, will not be signing a DNR. Most people who are, again, relatively young and healthy don't need a DNR at this point. What they do need though is an advanced healthcare directive, which is very different. Uh, the main difference between the two is an advanced directive uh, does not instruct healthcare providers to not perform CPR. In other words, if you have an advanced healthcare directive, a first responder is still gonna provide CPR, is still going to try and revive you if you're unconscious. Okay. In the directive though, you may designate or determine that if you are in an irreversible condition or vegetative state, then you may not want to be kept on life support. And so the healthcare director will state that you want to be removed from life support if you're in an irreversible condition. So those are two very different things. One, a DNR order is signed only in conjunction with your doctor and actually signed by your doctor. And an advanced healthcare directive is only signed by the person who's making it. 
Okay, so it's very important for our audience not to confuse the two. They are separate things for separate matters that, that a person may undergo. That's correct. Okay. Um, who should have an advanced health care directive and why should they have one then? So, uh, well, first of all, anybody who is 18 years or older, right, that's the age of majority in California, the age when you're an adult. And so anybody who is 18 and competent can sign an advanced health care directive. And so you ask, well, who should sign one? Well, anybody who's 18 and competent should sign one. So often uh, this is done in the context of an estate plan. So clients will come to me who are doing their estate plan, their trusts, their wills, uh, powers of attorney and other documents, and an advanced health care directive is part of that plan. So we advise our clients to prepare an advanced health care directive. We help them to complete it and to get it executed. But also if they have children who, are, who have already reached the age of 18, those children should also have a DNR because uh, once the person turns 18, the parents can no longer make decisions for the child. Right. Uh, that child is now an adult and can only make decisions for themselves. In fact, often when a child turns 18, the doctors will not even communicate anymore with the parents. And so an advanced health care directive will be important to give the parents, if that's what the child chooses, of course, to designate the parents to make health care decisions for them. So it'll be important for anybody who is 18 and, and competent. And competent is really defined by whether or not a person really understands what they're signing. Are, are they legal, legally competent to sign a power of attorney or a will or a trust? Do they know what they're signing? And it's the same thing with an advanced health care directive. Somebody who understands what the directive is, uh, the powers that they may be giving to others, the decisions that they're making within that document, all of those things are important to understand. So somebody who does understand those things and is competent to do so and is a, an adult can sign and should sign an advanced health care directive. Okay, so I, I did look at, uh, at the form that you have, and one of the things that um, it specifies to nominate is an agent. Can you discuss what an agent is in a, an advanced healthcare directive? Yeah, an agent is the person that you designated to make healthcare decisions for you. They're just referred to in there as an agent. So if, for example, I decided to have my wife be the agent for me, then in there I would designate in my advanced healthcare directive that I I designate my wife to be my agent to make healthcare decisions for me in the event that I can no longer do so myself. So the agent is the person who's making the decisions for you. Are you able to designate more than one and is it, is it advisable to have more than one? Well, in a healthcare directive, uh, it's really two, two different questions. In a healthcare directive, first of all, you should have, if you're gonna name one person to make healthcare decisions for you, uh, then you should have at least uh, two other people as backups. So you should have a first choice, second choice, and a third choice. So often I see healthcare directives that are signed by people that only have one person, right? I name my wife as my agent. And then there's no alternative agents in there in case that person that they named is not capable or if that person passes away, there has to be an alternative agent in there. So it's important to name alternatives. And again, my recommendation is having at least three people in an order of priority. Uh, the other thing is whether or not you should designate joint agents. That would mean that at one time, if something happened to you, you're designating two people to, to exercise the powers under the healthcare directive jointly. And so they have to make joint decisions about keeping you on life support or about other certain healthcare decisions that you've made within the document. And so, you know, whether or not it's advisable to do, to do so, you have to understand that there may be advantages and disadvantages to naming two people. Uh, one advantage, of course, is having kind of checks and balances, and it's not just one person making all those decisions. A disadvantage, though, is that those people may not agree. They may have a disagreement at some point, which could put a delay, bring about a delay in carrying out your decisions until they work out that disagreement. So there are advantages and disadvantages to naming joint agents. Okay, so do these th things, uh, disagreements sometimes end up in court off of, off of uh, an advanced health care director? Is that possible? They could, they could. You know, in my 22 years of estate planning experience, though, uh, it's not happened more than once or twice that I can recall. So well, it does mean happen. It could work. <laughs> very, yeah, very infrequently, but it, it can happen, certainly, um, but not very often. Usually they're able, before it gets to that point where it actually goes to court, uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, they work out the, whatever the, the disagreement is. But look, in, in the early 90s, people may recall the Terry Schiavo case. Yeah, that was a case in which a husband 
and the parents were in disagreement about uh, somebody's healthcare decision. Uh, so the, the, the daughter of these people had uh, not made a healthcare directive. And so it was, there was a fight between the husband who wanted to allow her to die uh, naturally without life support and the parents who wanted to keep her alive. And that fight went on for many, many years. So it really highlights the importance of having a healthcare directive and naming the person that you want to make those healthcare decisions for you so you can avoid those disputes. No, great, great answer and great example of why you want to be sure about the person. Yes, um, so uh, where do you obtain an advanced healthcare directive? This is really why I want to get, how do we get these into people's hands? So you can attain, obtain one. Well, in the case of uh, somebody doing an estate plan, right? Uh, when my clients come to me, and we do uh, an estate plan for them, then this is gonna be one of the documents that we prepare for them. So certainly an attorney can be the source of creating a healthcare directive for you. But they're also available online. Uh, you can go on the internet. Uh, the California Medical Association puts out a form. It's called a CMA form, uh, medical directive. The state of California has in the probate code a statutory form power that can be completed by checking the appropriate boxes and signing it. Uh, that is also found on the internet. So there are a number of ways to, to obtain one, but you know, not all forms are the same. Uh, many of them, of course, are gonna discuss and deal with the same kinds of end of life decisions, decisions about whether or not you're an organ donor, uh, whether you want you know, pain medication to be administered if you are in, a, in, a, in that kind of a condition. So there are often the same kinds of decisions in each of these documents, but some of them are more detailed than others. And so it'll be important for you to make sure that the one that you choose has the amount of detail that you want. Okay. Um, so then all advanced healthcare directive forms are not the same. Um, are they also, uh, are they valid across state lines? Is there an interstate aspect uh, that makes these acceptable uh, to other states if you happen to not be in your home state and when something happens? Uh, yes, yeah, so each state has their own laws with respect to advanced health care directives and what makes them valid. What are the legal requirements for signing a health care directive? Uh, just so that you know, in California, a health care directive has to be, again, signed by a, an adult who's competent and it has to be dated and it has to be either notarized or witnessed. And so uh, there are the witness requirements, you know, are, are important to review also because there's specific detail about who can and cannot be a witness, and there has to be two witnesses. So if you don't have a notary available, and right now with the you know, COVID-19 outbreak, uh, many people are not able to get a, uh, or have their documents notarized, it'll be important to do it by, by witness, by mm -hmm. signing a witness, uh, two witnesses. So you can do it either way. Now, let's say that somebody signs a healthcare directive in California and they travel to Arizona or Nevada or some other state, and they need to have that, that with them or that something happens to them and that directive needs to be administered in that state. All states will recognize the validity of a document done in another state. Just because the document wasn't done in the state that you're in uh, doesn't mean it's not valid. They will accept it, they will honor it, so it can be used in different states. Okay, um, and along that line, let's say for example you're traveling um, is it advisable to take something like this with you if you're going to be out of the state or out of the country just to help other doctors if you, something happened to you when you were that far away? Well, definitely, yes. I think it's important, first of all, for you to give, once the, the advanced health care directive is signed, it would be important to give it to certain people. So number one, you would want to give it to your doctor. Uh, or if you have more than one doctor, a primary care doctor and you know, other doctors, then you want to give them to each of your doctors. So they should always have one. Um, also, when you go into the hospital, you should always take that directive with you. They're going to ask for it at the hospital, and it's something that they should have on record. The other thing is that you should also think about giving a copy of your directive to the people that you designated. So at least, at the very least, to the right. primary agent that you designated as your healthcare agent, so that if something happens to you, that person will have it available. Uh, you may even want to give it to the alternate agents that you designated. Uh, so it'll be important to have that. I have clients who also carry that with them, that directive with them in their car so that they have it in their glove compartment for somewhere you know. <laughs> to get into a car accident. And certainly if you're traveling, yes, I would highly advise that you carry the directive with you. 
Okay, and what about the permissibility of uh, digital signatures or digital acknowledgements? So digital signatures of a, an advanced healthcare directive are permissible. Uh, under the probate code, there are, uh, there are details about, whether, about what type of digital signature is acceptable. There, has to be, there are certain requirements that have to be followed. The digital signature has to be, you know, meet US government requirements. It has to be unique to the person using it. Uh, the digital signature has to be capable of verification. It has to be under the control of the person using it. So a digital signature is permissible, but it has to follow certain requirements in the probate code. Okay. Um, now you ask about virtual notarizations. Are virtual notarizations permissible? And that, that is something different. Uh, so a remote or virtual notarization is where somebody, you know, a notary is viewing the person signing the document, not in person, but by video conference. And so in California, virtual notarizations are not permissible. They're not uh, valid. Okay. So you, you cannot use a California notary to do a virtual notarization. There's still the requirement of being in the physical presence of the person signing. However, other states do allow virtual notarizations. Uh, Nevada, Utah are two states that allow, and other states are actually relaxing the, the rules where they, that normally they do not allow for virtual notarizations, but because of what's going on right now with the COVID-19 outbreak, they are relaxing those rules and allowing them. Unfortunately, California is not one of those states, so you still need to get uh, a regular notary in the presence of a notary. Or if you cannot get a notarization, again, you can have two witnesses sign the advanced healthcare directive. And it'll still okay, and just to clarify, um, when I mentioned acknowledgement, that's the term that refers to somebody, somebody needing to notarize the document. So the process is their acknowledgement notarizing. So that, I just wanna make sure the audience is, is clear about the notary is also the same person acknowledging. Yes, the notary is the person who's acknowledging the person who's signing their signature. Okay. Uh, and again, that has to be in the presence of the notary in California. However, right. look, you, you can actually uh, hire a notary in Nevada. So if you're here and you want to sign your health care directive and you want it to be notarized because you don't have witnesses available, you can actually act with a mobile notary in Nevada. And because Nevada does allow for virtual notarizations, they can notarize that document for you, even though they're in Nevada, and even though it's a remote. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the, the fact that it's acknowledged by a notary where the notary is, as long as their notary is good how they issue it, then it would still hold up. It would still hold up, yes. Okay, great. Um, so the next question is, do you need an attorney to complete an advanced healthcare directive? No, no, it's not a requirement to have an attorney uh, complete an advanced healthcare directive. Um, in my opinion, it's, it's certainly uh, advisable to do so because there are a number of choices uh, that can be made that people often don't think about, right? For example, you asked me earlier whether it would be advisable to have joint agents uh, sign a directive. And uh, people may not understand what the potential implications of that may be. Uh, what the advantages and disadvantages are of a certain decision. And so often clients will ask me, uh, with my experience, I'm able to tell them, look, I've had these experiences before when you name joint agents or when you name, make a certain decision under your directive that could have adverse consequences. So having an attorney advise you is probably a good thing. But no, you don't, it's not required. Certainly you, anybody can go on to the internet, uh, find a directive, and as long as they properly complete it and sign it and get it notarized or witnessed, then that's fine. Another problem is often it's not done, com it's not done completely, it's not done uh, correctly, and therefore the person who's signing it or getting it executed does not really realize that because there's not an attorney there to advise them if they're doing right. it on their own. And it may be that that, that power of attorney is not, or that advanced healthcare directive is not valid, and they don't even know it. And it may not be discovered until it's too late. So somebody goes to use it, and it's determined that it wasn't done correctly. So for that reason, I really strongly advise that you sign them or use them uh, in the presence of an attorney. Got it, great answer. Um, so how long are uh, advanced healthcare directive forms valid once they're properly executed? Is there, do they expire is I guess the question. No, they do not expire. Uh, there, there used to be an expiration uh, back in the 90s. Uh, they were only valid for a certain number of years. But 
as of 2000, year 2000, the law changed, or 2001, the law changed. And so there is no expiration now, unless, of course, somebody signs the directive and specifically puts a date in there that, that, that it expires. But generally speaking, there is no expiration unless it specifically says so. Uh, not, notwithstanding the fact that it doesn't expire, it'll be important for somebody who doesn't advance healthcare directive to review these forms, right? At least, in my opinion, every two years. Do a review to make sure that the people that you designated are still the people that you want to make those decisions for you. If, that's, if that was done several years ago, it may be that the person you designated is either deceased or they're no longer capable of making decisions or maybe you've had a falling out with that person or for other reasons would choose to name somebody else. And so it would be important to make sure that that form, that advanced healthcare directive form, um, constantly is updated to reflect your current wishes. Okay, so, um, so this is not something for someone who is picked up being treated by uh, paramedics and who can't, not, is not sure what they're doing at that time. They can't just go give them a directive and have them try to execute when, when they are not sure of, of whether they have capacity or not, all right? Well, yeah, no, I mean, look, as I mentioned earlier, one of the requirements for signing an advanced healthcare directive is that the person who's signing it has to have the legal mental capacity, the, the ability to understand what they're signing. And so, if somebody is going through kind of some kind of uh, medical episode and, and they're now being you know, asked to sign a directive, well, that's not the time to do it. Uh, so it, it may be that somebody has waited too long. I get calls from clients who say, look, my, my mom or dad want to sign a power of attorney uh, or an advanced healthcare directive, uh, but they're, you know, they have dementia or Alzheimer's and they're no longer really capable of understanding anything. Well, it's too late at that point. Okay, yeah, that's, that's kind of the situation making... I wanted to speak, I would have you speak about, because that seems to be um, the, all, typically the consequence when people do no planning and then they're at the last minute and it may have already passed and they're still trying to say, well, can I still do something? I've seen, you know, had clients where they try to do that with the will or have somebody sign something when they're literally on, uh, you know, on their deathbed. Um, and then those things always end up in court challenged. Yeah, they can. They can. And there can be many problems with waiting, you know, and sometimes people just wait too long. And so it'll be important to do it. Uh, and, and nothing is, is really good to do to hold off until the last minute to do right. something, right? It's important to, these kinds of decisions are decisions that often take time for you to think about and consider uh, and determine, you know, who would be the best person making decisions for you. You may not even know, you know, whether you've made the decision to be kept on life support if you're in an irreversible condition. Do you want to be removed from life support? Uh, are you an organ donor? Maybe it takes time for you to make these kinds of decisions. And so it'll be important for you to, to give yourself enough time to think about what your wishes may be and then to sign it, you know, in, at the appropriate time. But waiting too long is often a big mistake that people make. Okay. Uh, so to whom should an advanced healthcare directive be presented and when should it be presented? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it'll be important to give the advanced healthcare directive before it's needed. So before you're, you're sick or you're going into the hospital, give it to your doctors and other healthcare providers uh, so that they have a copy on record. Give it to the people or to the person that you've designated as your agent to make healthcare decisions for you. And if you're going into the hospital, that'll be something that you'll want to take with you when you go to the hospital. Okay. Um, so in terms of our first responder community, um, they're, you know, square squared and ground zero of this day in and day out and a lot of these uh, oftentimes um people who are just doing their service to for others um they forget about themselves in the process so uh, clearly if you're one of those people in the medical or first responders um it's advisable for them at a minimum to at least give some pause to their day and you know try to get one of these completed if they haven't done any planning at all Yes, of course. I mean, look, an advanced healthcare directive is important for anybody, anybody and everybody, especially right now with what's going on uh, in the world. Everybody needs an advanced healthcare directive. Uh, and especially in those situations where people are first responders. Yes, doctors and nurses and firemen and policemen, other first responders and healthcare providers, they need to, they're on the front lines and certainly they need to have something in place. You're right. These people are people who are uh, usually taking care of everybody else first. Right. And they don't stop to think of themselves, but it'll be important at this point to, to think of themselves and their family, right? The advanced healthcare directive is, is for your family as well. 
to make sure that they understand what your wishes are in certain situations and that they can make healthcare decisions for you and not have to go to court or fight about it with other family members. So yes, it's important for, especially important right now for first responders. And in the last, you know, 45 to 60 days, I've helped numerous first responders put this in place. I've gotten many, many calls from doctors and nurses and others who are on the front lines um, wanting to make sure that they have a plan in place. And so that's great. That's great. News. And the other estate planning documents that will be important for them as well. Excellent. Um, is there something that, that you should discuss with your family about having completed one of these uh, advanced healthcare directives or what, what would be the recommended way to have a conversation with the people that you care about who may not be the agent. So, you know, they don't come in acting, not knowing that something has been done, um, but they also don't feel excluded from having not been appointed the agent. You know, is, is, is that a delicate conversation to have? Uh, it can be. So, you know, I think the question is, you know, who should I tell once I do the advanced healthcare directive, who should I share that with? Mm -hmm. And that's really a personal decision. There's really no right or wrong answer to that. Um, you know, many of my clients decide that they want to keep that personal. Uh, keep that private. It's not something they really want to share with anybody. And others decide, no, it's something that I do want to let my family know about. It's really a personal decision. But look, it'll be important, even if you're a person that decides that you're very private and you're not going to share the, the directive with, with anybody, it's important that you at least let your family know that you've done one, that you do have one, and where it's located, so that if something happens to you, your family will be able to find it and, and be able to use that at the appropriate time. So even if you choose to be private about it, they should still know that you have one and that in there you've expressed your wishes about certain healthcare decisions and you've named the people that you want making those decisions for you. So for those who choose to share with their family, and you know, I'm certainly one of those people, it's important for, for people to know that, hey, I have a healthcare directive. These are the people that I've chosen to make those decisions mm -hmm. and you know, to have any family discussion that they may want to have. Maybe that's the point where you would want to bring in anybody who may have some concerns about what your directive says, or maybe the people that you've chosen to make healthcare decisions for you so that those disputes don't happen later when the, 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 the directive is being implemented, when it's being used, when you're in the hospital and now you know, family is disputing over the choices that you've made. Maybe it'll be important to get that out in front so that they hear it from you, what your wishes are. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Um, and also, just to uh, copies of these directives when presented to, uh, to the interested parties that need to have them, the copies are valid for them to take, uh, you know, to treat it as if it's an original, right? That's correct. That's correct. Copies are just as valid as the original. So the original, we typically tell our clients, put that in a safe place, in a place where you normally keep your original documents and deeds and things like that, original documents, important documents. Uh, but give it a copy to, again, your healthcare providers, doctors, and to your agents, the people that you've named. And yes, a copy is just as good as an original. Great. Okay, so let's say we're in a situation that you kind of described uh, previously where um, you do have a falling out with someone who you may have nominated. What is the correct and proper way to have a revocation of your advanced healthcare directive? So you, all you, you need to simply sign a new directive designating new agents or you can also just sign a revocation of that person's appointment. So if you don't want to sign a new directive, you can sign a document that simply says, look, I created a healthcare directive on such and such a date. I designated this person as one of my agents. I'm hereby revoking that appointment. But otherwise, the advanced healthcare directive is effective as drafted. In other words, all you're doing is just removing that particular person. Uh, the other possibility, of course, is to revoke entirely your advanced healthcare directive and do a new one. So it can be done either way, but it's gotta be done in writing. Okay, so to clarify that though, if you were going to create a new one, do you have to specifically state that you're revoking a previous one that you did? Yes, and all the directives that I do for my clients, uh, because some, some may come in never having signed an advanced healthcare directive and others may have done a previous estate plan in which they have one. So in every single healthcare directive that I do, I revoke all prior directives. So yeah, it'll be important to do that. And it's a really good point, Derek, because uh, there have been situations where people sign a new healthcare directive and typically it's a form that they got online and it doesn't say anything about revoking a prior directive. And so now they have two directives that are right. <laughs> one that may name prior. Yeah. One that may name prior people and others that may name other people. And so there's a conflict. 
even the decisions they make in each of those directives may be in conflict with each other. So it'll be really, really important to make sure that uh, you, you revoke any prior directives. Okay, so then let's talk about uh, some of the consequences of someone not having an advanced healthcare directive. Well, I mean, one of the consequences, of course, is that your family is not gonna know what your wishes are. You know, it's difficult enough, uh, even when you do have a directive and that directive states your wishes, for example, about end of life. Let's say that I've chosen, look, if I'm in an irreversible condition, an irreversible coma or persistent vegetative state, and the doctor determined that I'm never gonna recover, then I've indicated that I do not want life support in those situations. And even though those are my wishes and my family would know that by reading the directive, it's still a very, very difficult decision to make to pull the plug. Imagine having to make that decision when there is no directive and you don't know what those person's wishes are, right? So often, uh, it, it not only does it make it difficult, but often there can be a dispute now because under the law, under the healthcare and safety code, it lists an order of priority of the people who have the power to make decisions if you don't have a directive. And let's say, for example, that it, would, it was all my children. All my children have equal authority. Well, now you've set up a situation where several people have authority and they may now disagree. And then there can be a, a dispute about that. So it's important for that reason to do it. So there's, very, there's a lot of adverse consequences that come from not doing one. Um, so clearly with the pandemic on, this is an important issue for people to share. Are there any other reasons just as a part of, um, you know, estate planning, you know, from my experience, I see um, still too few people do it and we see the consequences of that. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, why estate planning is so important versus reacting to an emergency as most people end up doing when they don't have one? Yeah, that's a good point, Derek. I mean, the reality is most people don't have an estate plan in place. 60% of Americans, probably closer to 65%, uh, don't have anything in place. So if they pass away, uh, people who die with property in their name or who become incapacitated and incapable of making decisions for, my, for themselves, if they don't have anything in writing, their family is going to have to go through a court process. At death, it's the court process called probate, by which a person's final affairs are settled. And that process is very time consuming. It takes a year to a year and a half to get through. And it's very, very costly. The fees are based on the size of the estate. So the larger somebody's estate, the higher the fees. And so when somebody dies without any planning in place, your family is going to have to go through a court process. If you don't have a health care directive, uh, they're going to have to file a petition to be appointed as conservator of your estate. Another costly court proceeding that often results in, again, disputes among family members. So it's really important for everybody not only to do an advanced health care directive, but to do a complete estate plan that consists of a living trust and wills and powers of attorney to ensure that your wishes are expressed about the distribution of your estate at your death and to ensure that you name the people that you want making those decisions for you all to avoid disputes among the family and to avoid those court processes. So estate planning is so important. It's important that everybody think about it and meet with an attorney who's competent and who has the, uh, special, the, the legal specialization to do that kind of work. Yeah, with our audience, I'd like to say Paul, Paul is an excellent estate attorney. <laughs> I've known him for over 10 years. They do great work. Um, and clearly you can see by him sharing this information, uh, he's a very generous person out there. Uh, Paul, could you share with us your uh, company website where they can either uh, get in contact with you about estate planning or obtain a copy of the Advanced Healthcare Directive? Sure. So my law firm is called Velasco Law Group. And you can go to velascolawgroup.com. And in there, it talks about uh, our firm, the attorneys in our firm, uh, the kind of services that we provide. And in there, we actually have a couple of down, free downloads for clients. Anybody or anybody, anybody who goes to visit the website can download an advanced healthcare directive, the form that we're very, the very form we're talking about here, uh, make the appropriate decisions, name the people that they want to make healthcare decisions for them, and then get that notarized or witnessed to make it valid. So it's free. You go down to the website, you download it, and you can uh, complete it. The other form that we've provided for free is a nomination of guardians. So if you have minor children and you pass away or something happens to you, it's so important for you to designate a guardian, somebody who's going to have uh, legal and physical custody of your children. Again, to avoid disputes among the family, it'll be important for you to nominate the right person. 
And so that's a form that is often done in conjunction with a complete estate plan. But if you don't have an estate plan, at least do that form. So an advanced health care directive is important, and so is a nomination of guardians. And both of those I've given for free by just going to the website and downloading it and completing it. Great. So, uh, Paul, first of all, I want to extend another thank you. Uh, you're, you're a very gracious person, big hearted. You do great work. And, and you. you know, the community at large uh, has to, you know, have more people like you. Um, a lot of people, uh, there are many great attorneys and you're one of them. Uh, so thank you for sharing what you have uh, on this topic here. Um, and also, we'll be hanging around for some Q&A after. Uh, the event is done, but uh, wanted to sit there and tell our audience, uh, we hope you enjoyed this and we hope you got something from it. Download the form if you don't have one. Uh, if you know of someone who needs one, tell them where to get it on VelascoLawGroup.com. And uh, thank you very much, Paul, for doing this. And thank you, Derek. I appreciate it.